Oh no, we haven't, have we? <laughs> we now have concepts of lazy loading and ego loading surfacing into our business domain. Right? Because there's no such thing as one sole customer, just like there isn't one thing as a list of invoices. Invoices can have different purposes and be different based on the requirements. So the example that I give you is a far-fetched example of something that happened to me, which is I did this list of invoices and I showed it to the customer and it had a list of invoices in a grid. Why did I do a grid? Can anyone tell me why I did a grid? It's simple, because the application before mine had a grid. Why did they have a grid? Because before them, they had a grid. Right? Why did they have a grid? Because back then, it was the only way to search for things. You used to click on name, and then scroll down to the ends, until you found the name you were looking for. That's all there was, grids. Of course, we brought grids into the 21st century, and we made them editable. Right? Because everybody knows that a customer wants to edit 50 records at the same time without giving any reason whatsoever. Just slap on a grid and tell him to do whatever. Oh, and he wants to capture intention. Fine, we'll add some logging. Why did you edit that record? Because I wanted to. So I gave him a grid and it showed a list of invoices and he said, I want a total. I said, okay, I'll go and add a total. And I brought it back and he said, I want status. You want status? Yes, I want to filter by status. Okay? So I went and added a filter status. He says, great. One more thing. What? Can you set it to pending by default? Right. But when you think about it, what the guy wanted was a number. He just wanted to see how much money is outstanding to be paid to him. But because he was accustomed to applications before that, and he said, I want a list of invoices, I just gave it to him. The only difference was that his application was running in a DOS window, mine was running in Windows. And it was a grid, a fancy grid. It looked nice. But it was doing exactly the same thing as his previous application was doing. And it wasn't my fault. Wait, it was. It wasn't his fault. Because he didn't know better. <laughs> But not because he didn't know what he wanted, he just didn't know if there are better ways to do things. Because he's been so accustomed to every application, the next guy coming in and saying, oh, you want to revamp your software? Fine, let's just see what the old one does. The best thing when you do a rewrite of a system is throw the old one away. And start talking to your customers to see what they want. Don't base a rewrite on, a new, on an old system. Who is why? Who is I? Why do you want this? When do you want this? Under what conditions do you want this? Do we ask these questions? Or we just say, you want a list of invoices? Here's your list of invoices. It's not what you wanted. You're an idiot. You don't know what you want. No. And then we, you know, we don't take any blame for this. We're developers. We do what we're told. It's not our job to talk to the customer. We're antisocial, we're geeks. I wonder if communication over Facebook would work. Concepts are lost. I say to the customer, set, mark this invoice as paid, right? Make this customer prefer. What do you do? You take a class called customer, you create a method called set status, and you pass in an element which is preferred. What did you just lose there? The intention. Make customer preferred to set status preferred. The act of making customer preferred has been lost. You've replaced it with your own internal name. And of course, if you had the added disadvantage of not being able to talk to your customers directly, which I don't know if that's just a Spanish met mentality or is worldwide, that some people are too important to talk to, so you have to go through layers, you get the Chinese whisper, which is, now it's really not what I wanted. So first of all, there's a mismatch between what the client wants and what the, problem, what the customer what he really gets. Okay, so think about that for a bit, and let that settle in. Now let's look at something else. Dan North was teaching test driven development as well, for many years, right? And he explained the same concept of 
TDD being about design. He was saying to his students, TDD is about design. It's not about testing, it's about design. It's about trying to design your class. So he would teach it and then he would say, right guys, go write a method that starts with test and put some asserts in there. And he was finding that it's very difficult for certain people to grasp the concept that this is not so much about test as it is about design. So he thought, well, let me try and eliminate all those words that had to do with this the test, assertions, etc., from JUnit. Let me write a new framework, which was called JBehave, which focused around eliminating those words and focused around describing what the system was doing. When I get a list of invoices, it will return this information, that information, that information. It would be more explicit. It would talk about exactly what the context of the test was. Context, there's a key word. It starts to introduce the concept of context. So when I have get invoice list, I have absolutely nothing. All I have is a method that says get a list of invoices. I have no context. Who is getting a list of invoices? Under what conditions are they getting a list of invoices? The context has been lost. Somewhere at the same time, there's another guy called Eric Evans, who's written a very best-selling book called Domain Driven Design. Any of you read that? Right, it's a very, very thick book, quite boring, but it's a good book. And he talks about one concept in this book, which is the ubiquitous language, which is what I was talking about earlier. When a customer says to me, make customer prefer, when a customer says to me, make mark invoices pay, I don't write code that says in my class, make invoice pay. I don't write a method in my class which is make customer prefer. I write code in my class which is set status. And there we lose intention and there we lose names and terminology that the business has introduced. And there is a mismatch. And what Derek Evans is talking about with the ubiquitous language is trying to use those same terms. And Dan North also at the same time took a look at this and said, hey, you know what? Maybe I should do that as well when I write these tests. Maybe I should be more explicit as well. We should add context. We should use the same terminology that we are using when we define the business. Maybe we should use the same terms, the same words. And stories were being defined like this. As a role, I want a feature that provides some benefit. Now, when I work on a project, I have an Excel list, for instance, and I say, list of invoices. Send emails. These are my tasks, right? Because I say, this is stupid. This is silly. Why should I write a story out like this? Why should I say, as me, I want to send emails so that someone receives them. But this is key, because this allows us to, write, to, to ask the right questions. Because the role, who is me? Who is the role? Who in my organization or my customer's organization is that guy? Because that can vary based on who he is, the result can vary. What is the feature? A list of invoices. Why? What benefit am I getting out of this? What is the business value that it's adding to my software to give you a list of invoices? What business value does it give you? Do you ask that question? Do you ask your customer, why do you want a list of invoices? Now when you do, this is the five whys. Why do you want a list of invoices? So that I see them. Why? Because I need to see the total. Why? Because I want to see how much money I'm on. So you don't want a list of invoices. You just want to see how much money you're owed. Yes. 
Why do you want a list of customers? Because why do you want a list of customers on a grid? Because I want to... Well, because the old program had it. Why? Because the one before that had it. Why? I don't know. Right? And then we say, hey, we don't need that feature. And believe it or not, dropping grids from applications make them a whole lot simpler. So the five whys and asking questions like this with this format allows us to see exactly what it is, what feature it is that we're adding to the business that provides value. It's about applying Yagni, right? It's about only writing code that matters. It's about only implementing features that matter. Now these stories start to give way to scenarios. So if I describe my story as a user, I want to log in so that I can buy tickets. So we can take the customer that is describing the story and we can sit him down with us, the developer, and we can sit him down with another user of the system, and we can sit him down with testers, and we can sit him down with QAs. And we all sit down, and we say, right, so this is a feature. Let's think of everything that could happen in this feature. As a user, I want to, buy, I want to log in so that I can buy tickets. So when I come to log in, what can happen? Well, if I have a login page, when I provide credentials, it can be valid and it will redirect me to the home page. If I have a login page and I provide invalid credentials, it will display an error message. If I'm on a login page and I type in 3,000 characters, it will throw a stack overflow. Those are the test guys, those are the QA guys that come up with those edge scenarios, which are good. And those edge scenarios, you know why they're good? Because they also tell us whether that edge scenario is a business problem we have to solve or not. Is it something we need to test that describes a new business scenario? Or is it something that I've been doing this for about six months and I refuse to restart? <laughs> it's just my way of imposing myself over windows until it crashes. So, it's about asking the right questions to see if from one feature we actually don't even have a feature but we have multiple features. So what has this got to do with TDD and DDD and all that? Well, we'll see. The given when then. If we talk about scenarios given the login page, when I provide valid credentials, I am redirected to the page of purchases. What am I doing in the given? I'm setting up a scenario. I'm saying given a series of things, I describe that scenario very well. I make no assumptions because no assumptions is a good thing. Because assumptions are the root of all evil. The assumptions are this is why the customer didn't get what he really wanted. Because I assume he wanted this. Because I didn't write, ask the right questions. So I never, never, never make assumptions. Because assumptions are those hidden things that suddenly start to surface in that scenario I'm trying to describe. And those hidden things that start to surface are important for that scenario and for that feature. When I perform an action, I describe what I'm doing as a user to the system. When I log in, then I say what the system does. Okay? So given when then, given when then, when, given the login page, when I provide the valid credentials, I am redirected to purchases. Given, set up a scenario. When, perform an action. Then, something could happen. Can somebody tell me what this starts to look like? The triple A in a unit test. Arrange, act, assert. So now, I can describe my scenarios as what? As tests. What is my scenario describing? It's describing one of n scenarios of what? Of a feature. 